Episode 4 of Band of Brothers is one that's been long stuck in my memory, because after Episode 3, where we followed Blythe, who wasn't the most confident or skilled paratrooper and was paralysed with fear for the most part of it, this episode was the polar opposite. Following Ball, Sergeant Randleman, we saw a man that had so much fight within him, and the strength to be able to survive the night in a town that was crawling with the enemy. Plus, we also got a heavy focus on what it was like for the new recruits and replacements to join the company and take the place of those that had fallen and were once close with the existing paratroopers that were there. So with that, let's jump into this episode and break down all that there was to take away from it. Here is a breakdown on Band of Brothers Episode 4. Just to let you know, this video will contain spoilers. The Interviews Like all of the other episodes in the show, this episode started with the interviews with the veterans. However, unlike the previous episode, the interviews occurred after the title sequence, which is the first time that it did that. I don't think it really meant anything, but yeah, it was just interesting that it occurred afterwards. Within these interviews, we had Donald King, who was also known as Pappy, James Alley, Earl McClung appearing again, and Lester Hashi. Just like we've seen with all of the other interviews, the discussion that was taking place and the experiences that we were hearing were all about what the title of the episode was about and the theme of what we were going to be going on to see, replacements. We saw the different mindsets that were present with replacements coming in and how some men didn't want to get that close to them because they knew that they'd eventually end up watching some of them die. But there was also a sense of them blending right in after a while because the replacements would eventually no longer be the replacements when more ended up coming in. There was also the understanding that there was a bit of resistance to them because they were taking the place of people that were no longer around, but the group went through Tokoa with. Hence why Pappy said how he felt like he had to prove himself as a replacement. You couldn't just walk in and be accepted, and it felt like that was the case with the first 20 minutes of the episode where they were all in the pub and there was a mixture of replacement and Tokoa men. The final part of this interview was spoken by Lester Hashi, and he said how he was essentially in awe of the NCOs and how he looked at them as heroes when he was entering because he saw how good they were and that they actually looked after them. The camaraderie and togetherness and looking out for one another was something which was present at the end of the episode where we saw many of the men not forgetting about Ball and being prepared to put their lives at risk in order to check if he was alive and bring him back to base, not knowing what they were truly walking into or even if he was alive. This was after they were frozen, in tears and petrified after leaving the battlefield. The interviews are such a poignant thing about Band of Brothers and it complements the story so well because you can really see the clear connection between all parts as the episode goes on and then the things that start to occur that feel connected to the very things that were spoken about during the conversation. September the 13th, 1944. This whole section was pretty much set in the pub in Old Burn, England, where we saw that many of the men that we'd followed from the start, such as Malarkey, Garnier, and Bull, were now promoted to sergeant and had men that were underneath them. I thought the handling of them being promoted was done in a subtle yet clean way, with it being incorporated into conversation and just showing us how much they'd progressed from the first episode. This was where we were introduced to some of the replacements, and we saw the real friction that was present between them. The likes of Miller, Garcia, and Hashi looked like they hadn't seen warfare yet due to their wide eyes and clean look when compared to the others that landed on D-Day, and there was a somewhat hostile atmosphere that was present in the pub. Garnier was welcoming to Randleman's men and he was having a laugh and a joke with them, but he was still stamping down his authority and experience when he said that he didn't care who was sitting in the seat before him. It was after this conversation had happened that we saw how other men felt. Martin was questioning what they were laughing at when they were joining in with the other men laughing, and we also saw Cobb saying how Miller shouldn't be wearing the Presidential Distinguished Unit citation on his jacket. This was issued towards the men in the unit for what the regiment did in Normandy, so he almost felt as though he didn't deserve to wear it even though it was something that was applicable for all men in the company. Pressuring him to the point where he removed it, left it on the table, and then walked out. This is something that you don't really think that much of at the time, but I think at the end of the episode, when you see that Miller died during Operation Market Garden, it hits hard. Because that's when you really see that whether they're a replacement or not, they're all just the same. They're there to do one job, protect the freedom of Europe and the world, and he gave his life for that. So him being told to take it off because he wasn't worthy of it hits so much harder at the end, because he made the ultimate sacrifice. 
We then found out that Cobb didn't actually fight in Normandy on D-Day when Bull approached him. This was because Cobb got hit in the plane before he got the chance to jump. All the time that Cobb was grilling Miller, you could see that Bull was probably biting his tongue in the corner, and the looks that were occurring from across the room showed that he didn't agree with what Cobb was doing, and that he felt that it was hypocritical for him to be saying that. It was also during this scene as well where we saw that Lipton, a personal favorite character of mine, got promoted to Company First Sergeant, showing again, like many of the men that he came through with, he was progressing as well. During this scene, a scene that was filled with laughter, drinks, and celebration, Lipton announced that they were going to be moving out again, something that instantly changed the mood, and it's something that always does throughout every episode. They were going to be moving out to Holland where they'd be participating in Operation Market Garden, an operation that's looked back at historically as a disaster, and an operation that was essentially doomed from the beginning and the moments of planning. Operation Market Garden was seen as an operation which had the intention of building a 103km salient into German territory with a bridgehead over the Lower Rhine River, which would create an invasion route for the Allies into northern Germany. This was planned with the hopes of getting into Berlin and marking an end to the war by Christmas of that year. This was shown to us through Captain Winters running through the plans. He said how they initially wanted to liberate Eindhoven and take the road between Eindhoven and Arnhem so the British Armed Division could then move up towards Arnhem. Whilst in preparation for the drop, we saw that Bull was going around and showing why he was considered the smartest man in the company, as was claimed by Garnier. He didn't have the viewpoint as much that replacements needed to prove their worth when compared to many others. He was giving tips to those that clearly looked like they needed it, who hadn't jumped before, and made sure that his men were in the best possible state and condition that they could be in, something that was telling of the person. During the preparation, there was a really interesting moment, and it was the second of the third time that we saw Sobel in the show. There was a sense of uneasiness that appeared with his presence. He made Easy Company into what they were and provided the foundations for them to be the best paratroopers that they could possibly be. But the promotion that he got was essentially a way of saying that they didn't trust him on the front lines and that the men didn't respect him enough to go into battle for and with him. And as he was looking around, it felt like nobody really wanted to make eye contact with him due to the feelings that they had towards him before. However, when he saw Malarkey, he noticed that he was a sergeant and saluted him out of respect but then proceeded to discipline him for the motorcycle that was present there. This just felt like Sobel trying to be able to wave some kind of authority over him and show that he was in a higher position of power, staying true to the Sobel that we knew from the first episode. There was also a moment in this scene as well where we saw that Popeye was back from being injured in Brekor, and he chose to discharge himself from the hospital and make his way back in time for the drop in Holland. This showed the mindset that some of the men had during the war. He didn't want to be assigned to another unit and wanted to be with the men that he went through Tokoa with, showing that even though he wasn't fit enough to be able to just sit down, he wanted to make the jump and be alongside the men that he trusted rather than wait to be ready and risk being alongside other men, men that he wasn't familiar with. It was after here that we then cut to September the 17th, 1944, the first of the eight days that was part of Operation Market Garden. However, we didn't actually see all eight days of action within the episode. During this time, Bull was still keeping an eye on his men and was giving them tips. For example, when somebody put a bayonet on the end of their rifle, he told them how they wouldn't be able to shoot as straight if it was on. As the men approached Eindhoven, they saw that a family was hanging an orange flag from their window, something which they weren't sure what it meant, but it was celebrating the fact that Eindhoven had been liberated and it was a way of showing the Allies that Germans weren't in the town and that it was safe. Eindhoven was actually the first major town in Holland to be liberated, However, as we saw later on in the episode, and what actually occurred in real life was the German Air Force later bombed it. It's said that between 180 and 227 people died during the bombing. When the men arrived in Eindhoven, the people of the town were waving Dutch flags and there were celebrations that were present all around due to it being liberated. This was something which many of the men were participating in. However, the more experienced men, such as Nix, Winters, Lipton, and Bull, were trying to get the men to keep moving as just because there were celebrations that were going on, it didn't necessarily mean that they were safe. During this scene, there was a moment where the woman that Talbot was kissing ended up being dragged into the center of the town and having her head shaved by the Dutch resistance. This was happening to the women that would be intimate with the enemy when they were in the process of occupying a city or town. This was also done throughout Europe and not only in Holland. Many women would end up facing worse punishments as well, such as being beaten or murdered by crowds whilst in public. And like what was said by the resistance member, many of the men were killed instantly for their cooperation. 
Later on that evening, we saw that Webster and two other men approached a house in the distance, and this was where we saw Webster using his German, something that does get a bit more focused later on down the line in the show. During this scene, there was a rather powerful moment where he handed the young son of the man who owned the house a chocolate bar, and as the boy was eating it, his father said how he'd never tasted chocolate in his life before. This showed the control that the Germans had over the town and the several year struggle that they'd been going through. Within real life, what actually occurred was that the Germans punished the people of the Netherlands by cutting off food shipments to the country, which ultimately led to 20,000 people dying of starvation. The next day, the men were making their way forward and Lieutenant Brewer got hit in the neck by the enemy as he was walking ahead of everybody and was exposed. Seeing Brewer in the way that he was was the first time many of these men had seen something like that and you could sense the fear that then took over their bodies and almost left them frozen in the spot and unable to move. Lieutenant Brewer was actually hit in the neck in real life. He was hit in the throat below his jawline, which knocked him down. Brewer was said to be quite a tall man, which ultimately made him stand out when compared to many of the other men. As we saw in the show, when the medic went to help him, the medic was actually shot too, something which was the case in reality. It was only when the local people helped him where he was then taken to an aid station and found safety. Brewer did eventually rejoin Easy Company at the end of the war after he'd recovered from his injuries. This was then when we saw the action taking place in the episode. I loved the camera angles during this scene as they were immersive, cinematic, and it really placed us there as we were watching it. The way the camera moved and tracked the troopers as they were running was something which I thought was so smooth to look at, and it allowed the pacing of the shot to match the mood of the tone that was unfolding. Everybody was getting in position with the hopes of taking out the Germans. When an enemy tank was spotted, we saw that Garnier went over to the Brits that were in operation of it, and they chose not to fire towards it, because even though it was there, they were instructed not to cause any unnecessary destruction. However, they were eventually fired at, and we saw the Germans proceed to cause severe destruction to the town, where buildings were completely destroyed, and many men were also killed in the process. It was just pure chaos, and with the intel that was provided by the Dutch resistance, something that Winters was reluctant to trust, because it was kids that were providing the information, they were told that most of the enemy would be made up of kids and old men, something which was most definitely not the case as they took heavy fire from the opposition. We saw a smart move that Bull was doing whilst he found himself in a ditch. He was crawling and was using the tank as cover, which meant that he wasn't able to be seen by the opposition whilst caught in the crossfire and he eventually hid underneath the tunnel and waited until the dead of night to leave. During this scene as well, we saw just how easy it was to be killed out there and how death can come at you extremely quickly. Men would be running and then, just like that, they'd be killed. We saw that Miller was also killed during this time as well, something which I thought was a sad moment, especially after the way that he was treated by Cobb at the start. Buck was also hit in the backside, something which does become a recurring joke in the show as that now made two people from Easy being shot there. Plus, once the men were out of there, Nix was hit in the head, but because he was wearing his helmet, it meant that he didn't suffer any long-lasting injuries or even minor injuries, showing how different it could have been if he hadn't have been wearing it. It was also here where it was said that there were four men that were killed, 11 injured, and that Bull was missing. At this point, we didn't know if he was dead or alive, but we went on to see him hiding. The impact of the operation and the men's exposure to death around them, but also the idea that they could have been killed in an instant was something that was on their mind. One of the men even said how they didn't even fire their weapon once, showing that they were essentially just retreating the entire time. Men were shaking, covered in blood, wide-eyed and in tears, almost questioning how it was that they managed to survive it. Cobb was also deeply impacted by it, as he didn't want to go back out there when the rest of Randleman's men made the decision to go out looking for him. During the night, Bull was inside of a barn and there were two Dutch people that entered and ultimately helped him. Randleman had an injury in his shoulder, which was actually the case in real life. This was due to a tank explosion and there were pieces of debris that were inside of him. Once the debris was taken out by the civilians, German soldiers entered the barn and as they left, one of them found the rag that was used to cover the wound with fresh blood on it. Following him noticing that and then also a sound in the barn, Bull proceeded to fight him one on one and killed him with the sound of the planes going overhead, meaning that the attack couldn't be heard. With blood on his face, this was an up close fight and different to any of the other times that he killed. He was looking into the eyes of the person that he was killing and although that meant something, it was either kill or be killed. From there, Bull survived the night and was eventually found by a surge from his own unit, people who believed that he was killed in action. That was the thought process in real life too. 
People didn't think that he was alive. When Bull was on his way back, he saw his men and the fact that they were out looking for him, and it showed the commitment that they had to him and the camaraderie that was present. They didn't want to leave a man behind, and he respected that. This was something which was also respected by many of the other men that were there too, as they were shaking their hands and showing that they'd now essentially proved themselves and were seen as equals amongst the men that had been there for a while. The moment Bull got back, we heard the announcement that it was time to move out, something which showed that there was simply no time for resting up and that it was a relentless press to then look for a different way to get into Germany. Winter stated how he didn't like retreating and this was the first time that they needed to do that. Operation Market Garden was considered a failure and has been looked back upon like that in the history books. It was said on screen that Easy Company lost 180 men and there were 560 that were wounded. But in the entire 101st Airborne Division, 750 were killed and 2,100 were injured. Plus, when we then look at the British 1st Airborne Division, they lost nearly 8,000 men. The strategy of the battle is something which has remained much debated for many years, and the operation in itself has proved to be a controversial battle for many reasons. It's said that the planning was optimistic. The weather went against them, which meant that the 101st Airborne Division was without its artillery for two days. There were missed opportunities, and there was a failure in the intelligence. So it's still widely discussed today. My review of the episode. I think this is a really good episode of the show. Even though it's an hour long, it's one that felt like it absolutely flew by. It's not as complex in the storytelling approach as some of the previous episodes, but it's more of a deep dive into the character of Bull and the operation that was considered a massive failure that cost the lives of many men. The scenes of the battle are one which I genuinely felt and I think are some of the best. The constant swarm of bullets, explosions, debris and pressing from the German soldiers was something that just felt like it was inescapable and you felt that death wasn't that far away for many of the men that were there. Having the focus on Bull after having a dedicated episode on Blythe in episode 3 was a great way to develop the journey of the show forward and show us a man that was considered one of the best soldiers that Easy Company ever had and that's according to Richard Winters. It was something that the real Denver Randleman deserved. The next episode that I'll be covering is episode 5, Crossroads, one that I think is a really good episode. It focused on Winters, his mindset, the conflict that he has and it just allows us to get a real good look at why the person is the way that he is. So be sure to stick around for that. So, there you have it, my breakdown of Band of Brothers episode 4. If you want to see more videos on Band of Brothers then click on the card in the top corner. I've got a playlist where I've broken down episodes 1 to 4 and I'll be releasing my breakdown on episode 5 in the next few days. What did you think of this episode? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for tuning into the video and I'll see you in the next one.